Okay. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York workshop. Um, we should have a pretty large group today, which is fantastic, and I recognize several names, so hello again. Um, to get started, I will introduce myself. I am Amelia Parks, the Archive Specialist for Dipsney. Um, many of you have seen me at workshops, and if you request an archival assessment, chances are I'm the one who's going to be working with you. Just so you're aware, the presentation is being recorded and it will be available on our website sometime next week. Some official information about us. Dipsney is a five-year initiative whose aim is to deliver essential training and services to New York's collecting institutions. Dipsney services include archival needs assessments, preservation and conservation surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and access to a variety of educational programs and workshops. Dipsney is making these services available free of charge to New York-based organizations that collect, preserve, and make accessible historical records and library research materials. Dipsney is a collaboration between two long-running New York programs, the New York State Archives Documentary Heritage Program and the New York State Library Conservation Preservation Program. It was established in 2016 by the New York State Education Department's Office of Cultural Education to ensure consistent and comprehensive services to the vast network of organizations that safeguard New York's records and make them accessible. The Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts are the administrators of the grant contract. And to be clear, Documentary Heritage and Conservation Preservation Programs are still funding projects outside of Dipsney, so keep applying for those grants. Okay, so as we go along today, feel free to use the um, Q&A or chat box on the side to send questions that you might have as we go along. I will probably be responding to some as I go along and holding others for the end. Marissa, the Dipsney Communications assistant, assist, assistant is here with me and she will be helping me with fielding the questions and any technical difficulties that might occur. Um, all right, so this webinar came about because we have seen a real need for improved housekeeping um, in many institutions. And the needs range quite a bit. In some places, exhibit areas look great, but maybe the stacks haven't seen a broom in, you know, five years or so. In other places, they do their housekeeping fairly often, but they don't have a plan or procedures. So today I really wanted to provide information on creating a comprehensive housekeeping program. All right, so our goals for today um, are these, and hopefully after this webinar, you will have the tools that you need to create a housekeeping policy and implement standards that follow the best practice. So many institutions overlook the importance of housekeeping to preservation activities. This is not a menial task. Um, it is integral to stewardship of your collections. All these professional associations address the importance and responsibility of stewardship and preservation. And make no mistake, cleaning collection materials and their storage areas is a key aspect to preservation. So who is responsible for collections care? And I'm really sorry, I see that there's some formatting issues. Um, with the translation of my slides. Um, sorry about that. Um, we can provide a PDF copy if anybody wants that will be not as janky. Um, anyway, so who is responsible for collections care? Um, it's really everyone. So the director, the board, staff members, um, patrons, and visitors in a way, your facility staff, janitorial, security, everybody who's working or interacting with collections is responsible for their care. 
And sure, you might raise an eyebrow at the thought of a board member or the director joining in housekeeping, but um, they need to be on board with the policies and they need to support the enforcement of those policies. So this is something to think about when writing up your own housekeeping policy. You need to make sure that you're running it past the board or the director or whoever makes those higher um, decisions and make sure that they're on board with it and will support you in your own efforts. So every staff member or volunteer who has contact with collections material or uses collection spaces needs to be involved and trained in housekeeping procedures. Okay, let's take a look at why housekeeping is important. Um, so housekeeping fulfills part of the legal and ethical obligation to care for your collection. And housekeeping is cleaning, but it is also um, a method of preventive conservation and preservation. It is really a far more complicated process than simply vacuuming and dusting. So let's look at why. Um, okay, so we've talked about the 10 agents of deterioration in other workshops and webinars that Dipsy has done. And these are really the cornerstone of understanding preventive preservation. This is not the focus of today's webinar, but if you are interested in learning about all 10 of them, Dipsy has a really great webinar called Collections Care Basics that goes over each of these as well as some other things. And you can find that information on our website. The link is provided on the slide. So what exactly are the 10 agents of deterioration? Each agent is an external force that can cause deterioration or damage to your collections. And it can also be prevented. That's the key idea here. So by understanding the risks that they pose and the ways to mitigate them, you are well on the way to protecting your collections better. Okay, so we're going to go over the ways in which good housekeeping policy can help prevent um, the 10 agents that are highlighted in blue. Okay, so first up is physical force. So deterioration from physical force can happen through impact, shock, abrasion, pressure, um, or vibration. Physical forces can be fast and catastrophic or they can be slower acting. Um, with. Uh, with minor but repeated opportunity for damage. So think of dusting surfaces with something that causes microscopic abrasions. Um, slow forces can also include improper handling or even vibrations from nearby construction or from other sources. Okay, so pests and mold um, kind of go together. And I, pests can also include rodents as well as insects, um, mold, other microorganisms, that sort of thing. So mold outbreaks can seriously damage collections and um, they are also a health hazard to humans. Active mold excretes enzymes that can alter, weaken, and stain paper cloth, and leather. In addition to affecting collections, mold remediation can be very expensive. And when it comes to insects, um, many of them are attracted to the adhesives and starches that are found in paper collections. Um, cellulose, paper and cardboard, cellulose would include um, paper and cardboard. Um, proteins can include parchment and leather. These are also attractive to some pests. In addition to damage caused by eating, damage can also result from tunneling, nesting, and bodily secretions. So regular and systematic housekeeping procedures can prevent much of this damage. And if there's a new mold or pest problem, um, having regular housekeeping procedures enable you to deal with the situation early on and catch it possibly before real damage to the collections takes place.
All right, so pollutants cause chemical damage when they come into contact with cultural heritage items because they catalyze or accelerate chemical processes that result in the deterioration of collections. Pollutants, also referred to as contaminants, um, can be generated both outside and inside buildings, and it can contribute heavily to the deterioration of library and archival materials. The two general types of pollutants that contribute to deterioration of collections are particulates and gases. These can be airborne or they can be transferred by direct contact. Airborne pollutants include acidic acids and ozone, gaseous contaminants, especially sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, peroxides, and ozone, catalyze harmful chemical reactions that lead to the formation of acid in materials. And this is an issue for paper and leather, which are particularly vulnerable to damage caused by acid. Paper becomes discolored and brittle, and leather becomes weak and powdery. Organic and corrosive acids, such as sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, formaldehyde, can be emitted by inappropriate storage or cleaning materials. These will cause chemical deterioration, such as corrosion, yellowing, and embrittlement. Particulates can include um, soot, dirt, and dust. Dust and dirt actually have a very large organic component. They consist of um, things such as vegetable matter, skin and hair, pollen, um, which together are an excellent food source for pests. They can be abrasive and disfiguring. They can absorb moisture from the surrounding atmosphere, which puts uh, those objects with dust on them at risk for mold. Pollutants can be deposited by direct contact with artifacts from oils and salts on skin transferred during handling. So again, this is why proper housing and handling is so important to the preservation of your collections. Okay, the final agent of deterioration we're going over today is custodial neglect. And this can result from different factors. So an artifact can become lost, the information associated with it can be lost, or it's just not properly cared for. Um, this is actually the only one of the 10 agents of deterioration that is non-physical in nature, although the effects of neglect manifest themselves physically. One type of custodial neglect occurs when active care is not taken to preserve the collection or when information and practices on collection care are not current. Um, the second type of custodial neglect is the disassociation of collection objects and their records. So ensuring that collection records are properly kept and maintained is of the highest priority. It's important to make sure that part of the training involved for housekeeping takes this issue into account. So materials should always be returned to their rightful place and staff need to actively observe collection areas to ensure that nothing is amiss. Okay, let's talk about the policy itself. Okay, so why create a housekeeping policy in the first place? Tasks such as dusting and vacuuming are forgotten because it's not always a task that needs to be done frequently. Um, depending on how much traffic your archival or exhibit spaces get, you may only need to do thorough cleaning a few times a year. Um, it is a good idea to pair some of your housekeeping tasks with monitoring. Uh, when you do regular environmental or pest monitoring, go ahead and take a few extra steps and walk around the exhibit or the archival storage spaces to check for things such as dust, debris, or really anything out of place. I've seen uh, many housekeeping policies that are really simple as a statement saying, regularly maintain clean spaces in collection areas. And having a statement like that is fine. It's certainly better than nothing. 
But if you want a really effective housekeeping policy, I would highly suggest that you include a timeline as well as procedures outlining what needs to be done. Timelines can be simple, um, something like workspaces should be cleaned once a week, stacks will be vacuumed and dusted twice a year. Your cleaning schedule should depend upon the amount of traffic an area receives. Exhibit spaces will get regular foot traffic, which means more dust, um, whereas some parts of the stack may get little to no traffic. Um, it saves the collections. So remember that prevention is the best way to preserve your collections and keeping collection areas clean is a crucial step in preventing deterioration. It is a good use of resources. So yes, it saves resources through pre prevention. Um, it can help prevent costly mold or staining treatments. It can prevent damage from pests. And of all of the preservation act actions that you take, Housekeeping is uh, fairly cheap. Systematic and continuous approach to best practice. Make sure that you cover um, all the spaces and the steps within your institution. And when you have those steps written down, it means that you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time you clean. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is um, show you some excerpts from two different housekeeping policies that are really considered the gold standard. Um, one of them will be the Fairfax County Park Authority housekeeping policy, and the other one will be from the Minnesota Historical Society house, uh, housekeeping policy. So we're going to start with a table of contents from the Fairfax County. and I guess before I dive in, I do want to be very clear on something. Using another institution's manuals and policies is a really fantastic way to save yourself time. But make sure that you do not just print off somebody else's housekeeping policy and put it in a binder because that's where it's going to stay on a shelf, gathering dust, which probably won't get cleaned because you don't have a housekeeping policy that works. So, if you print out somebody else's policy as an example, make sure that you customize it to your own institution so that they actually work for you. Um, both of these housekeeping policies that I'm going to talk about, they are publicly available on the internet and I've provided links which are overlapping the titles um, on the slides. But again, the PDF will have these and it will look much nicer. Um, okay, so starting with Fairfax County. Um, it has a lot of really great uh, sections to it. It is really detailed, it is thorough, and um, I think both of these manuals are over 30 pages long. So this is quite lengthy. Um, if you're thinking that you aren't going to be able to have the time to write a 30 page long policy, there are sections that maybe you don't need as much. So a section like purpose, is really great, but it's not essential. Um, this is also the manual for you know an entire county, or in the case of the other one, it's a manual used for several different um, sites. So it had both of these have to cover a very wide variety of topics, and it does need to be fairly broad. You may not need everything that's in these, so don't get scared off. Um, just as a side note, whenever I suggest, what, whenever I'm talking about creating a policy, I always like to suggest that uh, you set up a committee to help write or edit it. I mean, policy writing can be tedious and time consuming, so it's really better to divide and conquer. All right, here is the table of contents for the Minnesota Historical Society. Things I like about this one, um, I like that there are different sections that emphasize exhibit versus archival areas. For many of you, this is applicable, and they do require different uh, cleaning techniques. Um, I also like how the introduction for the Minnesota Historical Society mentions how important a good, stable environment is to collections care, and they stress the importance of a holistic approach to preservation. 
they say it's not just cleaning. There are other things that go along with it. Um, okay, so we're going to look at details from the most essential sections of these policies. Okay, so starting with handling collections, um, these are just excerpts from the handling uh, sections. So the Minnesota Historical Society, they're painting broad strokes, such as mandating that all staff work with, um, working with cleaning and collections, they need to be trained. Um, at the Minnesota Historical Society, training is provided by a conservation department this may not be an option for you, but there are other options that you can go with. So maybe there's a local conservator that's willing to provide training, or you could designate an employee or a volunteer to seek out training and in turn train others at the institution. One thing I would suggest is yearly training for everybody. I worked at a place where every employee and volunteer who came in they were trained on how to handle the collections like as part of their initiation, but after that it was never refreshed. And by the time I got there, I was noticing that a lot of the staff and volunteers who were handling the objects were doing um, significant damage to them because they were careless. So when you have a policy that states there's yearly trainings, then nobody gets singled out, everybody gets a request and everybody gets that refresher course on the proper way to handle things. And that's really important. I mean, even um, those of us with many years in conservation or preservation, it's still good to have those refreshers. So on the Fairfax County example, uh, there's this more of a list of uh, instructions for specific situations, which is kind of nice. And I included a couple of the instructions that I particularly liked, um, such as set the object down safely before answering the phone, opening a door, or entering into a concert, uh, conversation. I mean, how many times do you have, you know, a fragile document in your hand when somebody walks in the room and you start talking about, oh, hey, how was your weekend? It's important to remember that you still have that fragile thing in your hand, and it's a good idea to put it down. So I like that they were reminding you of that. Um, also, they have a, instructions for if there is damage done to an object during handling. Um, it outlines a bit about how you should approach that because unfortunately, even the best of us have made mistakes and damaged something in the past. So it's good to be upfront about the possibility of that occurring and what to do if it does. Okay, cleaning by material type. And again, these are just excerpts. So from the Minnesota Historical Society, we have historic textiles, and from Fairfax, we have books. Um, looking at both of these manuals, all of them have very comprehensive descriptions of how to deal with each material type. So it's a really great resource. Uh, make sure that your own manual covers all of the materials in your collections. If you are not a conservator, make sure you do your due diligence in your research of cleaning instructions. So look at multiple sources from trusted institutions, such as these two publications. Um, also, the National Park Service and the Smithsonian have excellent uh, resources. I would have loved to show you some of those today, but the government shutdown has also shut down their websites, so I couldn't pull up any of the screenshots from that. Um, also, feel free to contact Dipsney. We have um, a really great online resource, resource page that has a lot of links to these um, resources. And also, if you have a specific question, feel free to email us and we can find some stuff for you. Also consider uh, connecting to collections, which is a forum monitored by conservators. They can be really great at answering specific questions. And I'll talk more about that later. So having sections 
um, about cleaning by space or by zone is also very important. So Minnesota Historical Society gives different directions for storage versus exhibit space. These different spaces have different needs and um, those should be outlined. Um, even if everything is kept in boxes in your storage spaces, which I mean, let's face it, that's unlikely. Detritus still builds up in the form of dirt, bug frass, um, unfortunately feces sometimes, um, and all of these can contribute to a host of preservation problems and it can make the damage from something like a le leaky pipe so much worse. Fairfax County uses a formula for each space that I really like. Um, each page is like a form and it specifies sections such as the frequency, equipment and supplies that are needed, any preca uh, protections or precautions uh, cleaners should take, and it also outlines the procedure for cleaning in that space. Um, if you use this template, um, having a section like protections and precautions is really great if you have a space that's moldy. Um, you can warn your volunteers that they need to put on a particle mask before entering. Um, both places mention the frequency each space should be cleaned, and that is really important. You can also do that in uh, different ways if you don't like doing it in a form. Okay, which leads to schedules. Um, having schedules for cleaning is very important. And again, these are just excerpts. So if you look at the full um, policies online, they'll give you examples for daily, monthly, yearly, whatever. Um, and I do like how under the Minnesota Historical Society, they talk about how um, pest management or IPM should be included in your schedule. And this is important because a lot of places actually contract out with pest control, but you can't just trust them to take care about, to take care of the pests. Um, you should be in communication with them. So even if a pest company is doing the monitoring, you need to make sure that you're looking at those reports and kind of double checking things to make sure um, they're following best practices. Schedules should include daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever time frame works for you. Detail the zones and the collection materials that need to be cleaned. Um, both of these policies that I'm showing you, they do written out schedules such as this, as well as providing charts like you see here. Um, so the charts specify the method, the object or section that's cleaned, the name of the person who did the cleaning, frequency, um, any problems. And these are really great things to have um, on hand in your policy. You can just take it out, make a copy for that cleaning um, time. And so that pretty much wraps up the essential elements of a housekeeping policy. You may also want to include sections for creating displays. You could have your supply list in there, a vendor list, contact information for people such as maintenance, pest management, the director, really whatever information you need to create a smooth running housekeeping program. Okay. So um, creating your own policy. And I know that many of you work in small organizations and you may even be the only employee in the archives. So I don't want you to take a look at these previous policies I talked about and think there's no way I don't have time for this. It's never gonna get finished. So why start it in the first place? So next we are going to break down what you actually need and the expectations for best practice. Okay, so these are the benchmarks that we're going to use. Um, we're going to look at the basic uh, steps you need to take to meet that um, responsible sh stewardship. And then, you know, the next best, and then that best gold standard for housekeeping. 
All right, so for that basic um, benchmark, these are the minimum points that you need to follow in order to follow best practice guidelines for cleaning. So that would be, you need to have a written statement. It indicates that your institution is dedicated to good stewardship. Um, it makes you accountable for your actions and it encourages best practice over time and through staff changes. Um, it does not need to be its own standalone policy. As long as you have a general statement in your collection management policy, that is acceptable. Um, so you need storage and exhibition areas should be cleaned on a regular schedule. All garbage containing food should be removed from the facility on a daily basis. Uh, cleaning supplies and tools need to be kept in stock. And ideally, you would actually want your collection cleaning supplies to be separate from, uh, say, cleaning supplies for the break room or the bathroom, because you're going to be using very different um, supplies for these two uh, areas. Staff should also be trained in what techniques are appropriate when cleaning around collections. And um, you should have steps to take. So if you notice theft or damage or pests, you need to have steps written out um, so that your staff or volunteers can report what they see. Now, if you had all of these things done and I was to do a site assessment for you, um, I would commend you for doing a good job on housekeeping. I would also provide recommendations on how to do it better, but this is completely adequate. If you wanted to do a little bit better, we can look at um, the good benchmark. So a conservator should be consulted ideally about what cleaning products are appropriate for use around collections material. And I realize that you may not be able to hire a conservator to come in for a consultation. However, if you do have specific questions about using a cleaning product or an item, um, or how to clean a particularly fragile object, there are places such as connecting to collections and the Society of American Archivist email lists where you can post questions. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that on the next slide. You need a formalized standalone housekeeping policy um, covering all those points that we talked about earlier. And your staff should be trained to notice and report changes in the collection that are observed during cleaning. Okay, so these are those two resources that I've mentioned a couple of times. Um, connecting to Collections used to be run by AIC, but I think it's run independently now. And what it is basically is a forum where people can um, ask questions and professional conservators will answer. Uh, just I think about a month ago, uh, somebody asked, posted a question onto the forum about cleaning a piece of furniture that had residue from an apple on it. I didn't have room to show the reply from the conservator, but um, she got a very good reply. So this can be a very useful resource to you. Um, you do need to register, but it does not cost. For the Society of American Archivists or SAA, they have several different groups, some of which you need to be um, a paying member to participate in, but others are free to the community. So I would check it out and see what um, is available to you. The preservation group is really good, but also loan arrangers is very useful as well. Um, again, there are also fantastic resources on the National Park Service Conservagram. I'm so sorry I could not show you examples of what those look like today, but um, it's definitely worth a look um, for many collections care issues. Okay, so if you wanted to create the best housekeeping policy possible, um, you would wanna follow all of those recommendations talked about previously, as well as these. So you need a system in place for ba uh, basic cleaning, a way to track what has been done and what needs to be done. 
Um, there should be an annual training session uh, for staff members involved with housekeeping and collection areas. And you need to have an integrated pest management program in place. Also, um, things you should do are check your supplies and tools for effectiveness and for need of replacement um, and that sort of things. But that is it. That should be what you need to cover for, you know, basic through best policies. So let's talk a little bit about um, the tips and techniques for uh, housekeeping. By the way, I would like to mention, it is really difficult to find uh, photos of men doing cleaning. So I think this is one of two that you get. Um, okay, so depending on your collection materials, housekeeping can become complicated. This right here, this is just a small example of the many types of spaces and materials that um, any given institution may need to deal with. And there is no way that I can talk about techniques for cleaning all of these materials and spaces in an hour. So when making your policy and conducting training, do your research, look at conservation sites, at Dipsy resources, and other reliable resources such as the National Parks Conservagram. Um, make sure that you are developing a policy that is appropriate for your collections. For today's purpose, we're going to go over some of the basics um, that are common or useful for pretty much everyone. Okay, so these are your basic tips. Keep spaces clean and tidy. Don't bring dirt in. Treat each object as if it's irreplaceable. Uh, looking as much as doing. Active observation of your collection spaces, whether it's exhibits or spa, uh, stacks, is really, really important. Um, honestly, just as important as doing the actual cleaning. Uh, you don't need to overclean; that can be damaging as well. Whatever you do needs to be reversible and non-invasive. Do not rush the task. And don't eat or drink while cleaning. I know sometimes it feels like this profession requires you to have a coffee cup glued to your hand, but don't take it with you when you clean. Okay, I mentioned this a couple of times, active observation. This is a really important part of housekeeping and collections cares, care. So you should look for things that are moving that shouldn't. Any cracks or leaks, um, any evidence of pests, efflorescence or spalling. Um, this is for those of you who may not know, efflorescence and spalling is caused by moisture soaking into, say, a wall, and it dissolves the salts and minerals that are in the wall. And then as the water evaporates, those salts and minerals come to the surface and can create bubbles or um, the surface area flaking off. Really, you're just looking for any sort of change in appearance, um, and not just in the collection items themselves, but in the building, because that building envelope is part of the system that is used for caring for your objects, and a crack or efflorescence can be an indication of a bigger problem, such as a leak in the roof or dry rot, things that need to be taken care of. Okay, um, gloves or no gloves, the eternal question. For paper, uh, conservators now say that gloves are not necessarily needed. Just make sure that you wash your hands before handling paper and do not put on lotion. There are some materials that should be handled with gloves. So photographs should always be handled with nitrile gloves to protect the emulsion from oils on the hands. Gloves should be worn for handling most objects. And we recommend nitrile gloves over cotton for many reasons. Cotton gloves are extremely absorbent. They do not allow for much dexterity and they easily become as dirty as fingers and hands. Because cotton absorbs so much and um, so quickly, it can become dirty and often it makes bare hands preferable. 
The fibers on cotton gloves can also snag or tear paper and other friable surfaces. Um, nitrile gloves are also useful because they make objects such as glass less slippery. Um, they provide a little bit of extra grip, which is nice. Fingerprints uh, can also become etched on metal and lacquerware objects, so it's extra important to wear gloves when these types of materials are handled. Okay, so remove accessories. This includes belts, neckties, um, any sort of jewelry. Be careful of the buttons on the front of your shirt or on your cuffs. Um, which again is a great reason to wear a smock or an apron to kind of cover those up. Um, but even though I'm talking specifically about accessories, you really need to be aware of any sort of sharp um, or hard surface that you're using, even with your supplies. So um, if you take a look at this brush here, a lot of the natural bristle brushes have that metal band um, holding it together. And I actually worked with an object conservator who would have us just tape around that metal part with just that blue painter's tape. And that kind of softens those sharp edges that could cause a scratch on a surface. Um, okay, so moving objects. Make sure these are just basic tips for that. So check your route um, and prepare it. So make sure that doors are already opened um, and prepare a space. So you should never move an object without having a landing space prepared to set it on. Um, think about how heavy it is, how many people are needed to move something. Make sure it has the proper support. Always use both hands. Never um, move something more than what is necessary and only move one object at a time. And, um, you know, moving objects can be a lengthy subject. So Dipsy actually has a great webinar on this called Preservation and Exhibits if you want more information on um, moving heavier uh, objects. Okay. So more basic tips, and we've talked about some of these before. So divide your work into zones. It's just a lot easier to um, tackle cleaning an entire institution if maybe you're only doing a floor or a couple of rooms a day. Um, make sure that you use the appropriate tools, replace those tools when dirty, and of course, never use pens or markers around. Okay. Let's talk about housekeeping supplies. Something you should never use as Brillo. All right, so all right, so you can see almost, yeah, you can see everything on these lists. So um, you need a vacuum, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. You need dust cloths because remember, dust is a terrible thing to have build up in your institution. Dust is abrasive on a microscopic scale. Um, dust contains pollens, thin cells, insect bit, other organic matter that can feed mold. Dust can also be acidic and it attracts uh, water, which again can cause staining, corrosion, or mold. So choosing a dust cloth is actually quite important. You do not want a cloth that will abrade the surface, leave a residue, or leave behind dust. Um, some dust cloths are made to be used damp, um, and this is okay for some things, but it is inappropriate for many others, so make sure you're paying attention to that. Um, microfiber cloths are really great. Uh, cotton cloths are fine, too. Just make sure that you're reading what they're made out of. Um, unbleached muslin uh, fabric can be used to cover or wrap large items, and this just helps prevent dust from settling on those objects that you maybe don't access regularly. For uh, those of you who sew out there, you may have noticed it's getting more expensive and harder to find unbleached muslin. Um, there are other fabrics that are acceptable, such as polyester and acrylic. 
Um, however, if you're purchasing these from a fabric store rather than an archival supply vendor, make sure that the fabric is not treated with chemicals. Orvis is a gentle detergent without dyes or fragrance, which is really great for cleaning. Um, your brushes can be used for dusting delicate objects. Um, and remember, you never want to brush the dust into the air. When you're dusting, when you're brushing dust off of something, it's nice to have the vacuum running near and you would dust, you would brush the dust towards the vacuum. Um, brushes should be soft and natural bristle. Gloves, we've talked about this earlier, nitrile gloves are what you want. Murphy's oil soap is good for wood and fiberglass window screening. So this, you would cut the screening into squares and then you would go ahead and tape around the edges uh, so it doesn't snag. And you would use these squares for cleaning delicate surfaces such as historic carpets or upholstery. Um, what you do is you place the screen down carefully and then you vacuum through it. You would not want to use any of these um, items that are on this list. Um, I think something that is not on there is Lysol, which I actually heard somebody suggesting wiping down documents with Lysol not too long ago. That is a terrible choice. Um, there are chemicals in Lysol and you may not see the damage that it does immediately, but over time it will cause yellowing and embrittlement of whatever you are dusting with that. Um, and again, I know I've talked about this a little bit before, before but when, dust, when choosing your dust cloths, make sure that they're not embedded with some sort of a dusting agent. Um, sometimes those can leave a residue behind. So whatever supplies you're purchasing, make sure you read what they are made of. All right, so when you are choosing a vacuum, Unfortunately, um, no single vacuum cleaner will do everything that you hope for. Um, if you wish for a stronger motor and a high degree of vacuum pressure, um, that's going to be at odds with a desire for compactness and portability. So, you know, do your research. And honestly, you're the only one who can choose the appropriate vacuum um, or preferably vacuums for your situation. However, um, there are a couple of things that you should look for when choosing a vacuum. So the single most important factor is a vacuum fitted with a HEPA or high efficiency particulate air filter. This filter will trap microparticles of dust and dirt that bypass the bag, um, which helps it, it helps avoid spewing dust back into the collections areas. Um, a good quality HEPA filtration system will filter particles as small as 0.3 to 0.12 microns. Second on your list of wants should be a vacuum that has a rheostat attachment to adjust the vacuum pressure. So for floors and non-historic carpeting, you're going to want um, high pressure, but for delicate cleaning of fragile historic textiles, you need that low pressure. Um, some vacuums that have been recommended by preservation professionals include Milfisk, I think it's Miele, like uh, Italian for honey, and Eureka. Okay, additional supplies. So when you're putting your supplies together, you also need to think about the kind of equipment that you need to support your cleaning activities. So when you're moving boxes or items on exhibit or um, other items, you need a stable flat surface to set them on. And depending on the object, you may need padding or supportive material to pre prevent the item from rolling or from multiple items to knock up against each other. So supplies that can help with this include carts, trays, tables, um, any flat surface really. And you can also use amphifoam or polyester padding to um, add some stability around objects that are likely to roll or shift. Uh, 
Okay, personal protective equipment or um, PPE. It's a good idea for housekeeping. Um, you should always, always use aprons and gloves. Um, although these are actually more important for collections care than for personal safeties, but there are definite advantages to personal safety or at least, I don't know, hygiene as well. Um, as for the long sleeves and the particulate masks, this is more of a recommendation, um, but if you have allergies, it's necessary. If your institution is just starting a housekeeping policy and you know that there's areas that are really dirty, I would say all of these things on the list are crucial to your employees' health and safety. If there is the potential for bug particles, feces, or mold in the areas that you're cleaning, PPE is absolutely required. And remember that um, many things such as mold, um, allergies and other health problems can build over time. So it's really best to minimize your exposure from the beginning. Okay, so we're starting to wrap things up. I do wanna go over a few resources. One are vendors. So these are in no particular order. They are all known for providing good preservation and conservation uh, supplies. Um, most of the thing, I mean, you still need to read what, uh, what things are made out of because sometimes archival is a term that is applied to something that isn't necessarily um, up to preservation standards. But um, also don't rule out art supply stores, upholstery stores, hardware stores, or even Amazon. Just make sure that you know what your supplies are made out of. Read all of the ingredients or the materials um, so that you're buying things that uh, are up to those preservation standards. And here are some resources that will help you in developing your housekeeping policy. So there is the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works. There's a lot of really great information on conservation of specific materials on there. Um, again, the National Park Service conservograms, these are so good. So make sure that you read through them. They also have a museum handbook, which gives a lot of great housekeeping tips. The Canadian Conservation Institute also has a lot of really great resources. The National Trust for Historic Preservation has um, housekeeping guidelines, which are really great. And there is also a link to a PDF on how to brush or vacuum an object. So that is it for today. Um, do you guys have any questions about housekeeping? Well, I'm sure you guys are thinking of your questioning. Um, I'll use this time to plug our webinar for next week. We've got one coming up on policies and procedures. So just in case you haven't had enough um, policy writing with housekeeping, um, check us out and see what we suggest for next week. Oh, thank you guys. You are all very nice.
Um, did somebody request the resource list to be okay? I'm going to go back to that. And again, we're going to send out the PDF because I don't know what happened with the translation from one program to another, but I'm sorry, the slides looked a little wonky today. Also, um, usually with PDFs, you can just click on the uh, link and then you don't have to type them out. So, okay, somebody has asked, do you think a doormat inside the front door of a house museum is a good idea? If so, what type of material? Um, I mean, you definitely want one outside of the door as well. Um, I don't see why putting one inside of the door would be a problem. As for the type and material, I mean, I'm not sure how much that really matters. You might want to let it off gas uh, somewhere else if you've got uh, collection materials in that room. Um, so just wait until it stops smelling plasticky, but it's one of those things where it trapping dirt does more good than the harm of what would hopefully be a small amount of off-gassing. So I think having one inside is a good idea, but outside as well. I also don't know that they make preservation standard um, doormats. Okay, if I had to pick between keeping file folders and boxes or metal filing cabinets, um, which is preferred, this is something I see so often. Um, I mean, if you're stuck with metal filing cabinets, you can make it worse, but using uh, dock boxes that are acid free and lignin free are way more preferable. Um, it's better for cleaning. Um, I mean, you have the potential of creating a microclimate within the filing cabinets, which is not ideal. Um, if you're stuck using metal filing cabinets, make sure that folders are not overfilled and that you have uh, spacing, you create spacers with um, acid-free, lignin-free cardboard to keep everything propped up, uh, you know, at a 90 degree angle. What do I recommend for cleaning reading room tables? Um, is this a special collection? Yes. Um, I would do Orvis, which was listed on the supplies, diluted with water, um, and just wipe down the tables with that. What type of cleaner should be used on plexiglass? You know, um, I did not put that in here because technically, well, exhibits aren't really part of this, but in both of those example policies from the Minnesota Historical Society and the Fairfax, um, and the Fairfax County housekeeping policy, both of those specify good types of um, plexi cleaners. So those would be really great to look at. Also, I'm pretty sure um, I've seen Gaylord and University Products. They both carry a plexiglass cleaner, so that would be a good place to start. Is it okay to use antique barrister bookcases for displays? Um, I mean, so wood is acidic. It can off gas, but um, I had a conservation professor also point out that 
At the point where something is an antique, most of the off-gassing has occurred. So it may not be ideal, but um, using antique wood shelves is acceptable. You might want to think about putting a barrier down on the shelves. You could use, um, you know, preservation grade Tyvek or Mylar or just um, acid-free, lignin-free paper. All right, it looks like questions are wrapping up. So um, stick around for a minute or two to see if people come up with any additional questions, but I think that wraps it up for today. Um, thank you so much for all of your questions. You guys have been really great.